Beginning today, we are commencing with a new series, Beholding the Beauty of the Lord. For most of this calendar year, we have been focusing on a series that we've titled Minding the Gap, in which we've looked at a number of issues within our own community, and some of those have implications for the community beyond us, of trying to bring synchronization between what we know to be true in the Bible and as it lines up with our experience. And the challenges specifically that that has brought, not exclusively, but mostly to our younger adults. And we're terminating with Mind the Gap. There are actually a couple more that I wanted to address and I will, but we will do those in standalone messages at some point in the future. And in preparation for today and for the remainder of 2023, I have been impressed with a series that I am calling Beholding the Beauty of the Lord. Focusing primarily around what we find in Scripture to be a revelation of God's character in the sanctuary. Our understanding of the sanctuary from the Bible is the single most unique contribution that we as the Seventh-day Adventist community can make to the larger Christian community. Now, there are other Christian groups that have studied the sanctuary in part, and we'll focus on an aspect here and an aspect there, but comprehensively, the, sta the understanding of God's character as revealed in the sanctuary is unique to the Seventh-day Adventist community. And today's message will focus not so much upon the mechanics of the sanctuary, but through the lens of David from Psalm 27, in which he responds to an invitation to God to seek God's face. Now, I don't expect you to remember this, but I have actually presented <clears throat> portions of this message before over the years. And you may remember some as we progress throughout this message, but today's message has not been packaged previously in the way that it is packaged today. Psalm 27, verses 7 and 8, we read this. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. I hope I make it. It's just dry back there today. <clears throat> In fact, could somebody... Get me a spare, one of these. When we think about faces in general, the human face is unique in the living world. We recognize each other with our facial features. Humans have more diversity in facial features than any other of the animal species if we want to speak about that from a biological perspective. And the most variable trait is the triangular design of our eyes, our nose, and our mouth. There's really no two people on the planet that have the exact same design. Those who study the human body tell us that there are 52 separate facial muscles connected to nerves 
expressing a range of emotions. And we can identify with this with that phrase that is rather common. I can see it in your face. Now that can refer to grief and sorrow. It could refer to surprise. It could refer to a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. Various individuals have made comments about the face over the years. Cicero, a couple of millennia ago, commented, <clears throat> the face is a picture of the mind with eyes as its interpreter. More recently, Marty Rubin, who is not necessarily a paragon of Christian virtue, <coughs> has commented that every face is born with a thousand masks to go with it. And I think that there's an objective truism to that. We wear masks, don't we? I've talked about this from time to time previously. We come and we gather here on Saturday Sabbath mornings and we greet each other and we say, Happy Sabbath. And oftentimes we reply with something of an echo, Happy Sabbath, but really inside we're not doing all that well. But we put on our mask in order to be approachable and conversational. <coughs> Oscar Wilde. Again, not a paragon of Christian virtue. It says a man's face is his autobiography. A woman's face is her work of fiction. Now, I'm, I, I, I'm just a male man. I'm not saying if that's true or not. <laughs> but culturally today, it has even greater significance when some in our larger culture are not even sure what a woman is. So there is some fiction there. Social observers have indicated that people who are taller and have rectangular faces are more likely to be leaders. I don't think that was necessarily true in Napoleon's case. People with strong personalities tend to have strong jawlines. More agreeable people tend to have larger eyes. Extroverted people have larger lips. People with larger noses seemingly have more ambition. And again, these are generalities. It's not going to be true in every case. There are shared behaviors in people with the same eye color. And extroverted people smile more. Now, I, I believe that was true. That extroverted people smile more. The human face is complex, is it not? And if we are created in the image of God, what are the implications about God's face? And what does it mean to seek God's face? I see it from the scriptures, and especially as we look at Psalm 27 today, that it is an invitation to intimacy. Now, I invite you to take your physical Bible and open it on your lap. We're going to have the scriptures on the screen, but I invite you to actually take your physical Bible and have it open on your lap, and you can glance back and forth from your paper copy of the Bible to what we will have on the screen. But Psalm 27 is an interesting psalm in that it is a combination of strength and vitality. The opening verse of Psalm reads this way. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. Can you feel the strength, the confidence that is oozing forth from David's mind to his heart to his quill, his pen, whatever he wrote with? 
perhaps he's looking back on that experience that he had with Goliath, in which he heard the taunts of the giant from Gath, and he responded with, well, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that, that he would defy the armies of the living God? And you know the story of 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 17, how he took the big man down. Just a stripling lad of a guy. There in the Valley of Elah. And that is a picture of the actual Valley of Elah. In Psalm 27, verse 5, we continue with this theme of strength. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. We live on the outskirts of Metro Charlotte, just over the line in Union County, actually almost in Monroe. And while you probably don't see this a lot in urban Charlotte, the picture that comes to my mind when I read these verses is the F-150 pickup. No, 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 no. Let's go with an F-250 Diesel, big mud tires on it, it's loud when it goes by, there's a flag in the back, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there is just testosterone oozing out of that image. And when we read these verses from Psalm 27 of David and this confidence, I mean, you'd think that he could never, ever be defeated. Psalm 27 is a psalm of trust, strength, but it's also a psalm of vulnerability and a prayer for help. Oh, the mood changes. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. That's an odd line, isn't it? Doesn't that just feel strange coming from David? And I've had to ask myself, where did that arise? It could, can't prove it. But it could have gone all the way back to that visit from the prophet Samuel to Jesse's house. Jesse, David's father. And the prophet asks Jesse, can I see your boys? And one after the other is presented to the prophet. And God tells Samuel, nope, pass. Next one, until all seven sons have passed before the prophet Samuel. And the prophet Samuel kind of scratches his head a little bit and says, is this it? Do you have any other sons? <gasps> oh, yes, there's David. <laughs> it's kind of like he's an afterthought. Son number eight. He was the baby of the family, but at least on that day, he didn't even register in the consciousness of his father. Oh, yeah, you know, go out, he, he's out tending the sheep, go out, bring David on in, and David comes in. Perhaps that event had an impact upon David's self-image of where he stood with his family. Teach me your way, O Lord, the psalm continues, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart 
unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Can you see, can you feel, can you absorb this bipolar psalm? Strength and confidence. But also weakness, vulnerability, some anxiety. And right smack in the middle of this psalm is verses 8, 7, and 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. And what I gain from this, as I've meditated on this psalm many times over the years, is that God initiates, he prompts, he invites, he appeals. I want you to be intimate with me in your seasons of strength and confidence and also in your seasons of vulnerability and self-perceived need. Now, when God says, seek my face... That could have a little bit of mystery for David as well. For in generations before David, there were other characters in the Bible who had had facial encounters with God. And they were somewhat scary. We think of Jacob who is accosted by a nighttime intruder into his space and a wrestling match ensues. Very strange event that went on between these two individuals until the day breaks and the intruder says, let me go, and David, or rather Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And as a result of that... Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. Literally didn't see his face in all the clarity of daylight, but there was a close, personal, physical, spiritual, emotional encounter. I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Being face to face is a close experience. Whatever the context of that closeness may be. For Moses, following the rebellion of the children of Israel, as recorded in Exodus 32, in which they worship the golden calf, there has to be a renewal of covenant relationship. Exodus 33, in that flow of events, tells us that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But then, a few verses later, we read these enigmatic words. You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. I have been close to you, Moses, but literally you cannot see my face physically, visually. I am a holy and righteous God. You may not live. Seeking God's face is intimacy. And in that intimacy... God accommodates us so that we can sense his presence. Hebrews in the New Testament tells us this, that our God is a consuming fire. And we are blessed because the holy, righteous God tempers his fire with his grace. So in Psalm 27, God initiates, he prompts, he invites, he appeals. I want you to want me. It is an invitation to intimacy. Intimacy in those seasons of strength and intimacy in those seasons of weakness and vulnerability. And David responds, yes, I will seek your face. Now from a literary standpoint, Psalm 27 is laid out in the structure of of what scholars refer to as a chiasm. And we've talked about that from time to time over the years. It is a literary device of Hebrew literature in which the main point of that particular literary piece occurs in the middle. In our Western way of thinking, we save the most important part until the very end. 
but in a Hebrew literary structure, there is a build-up to something that's important that's going to occur in the middle, and then there is an echo that occurs on the other side of that high point. And seek my face is right there in the middle. So you can see in these progressions of slides how these steps are initiated in the first half of the psalm and then echoed once again in the second half of the psalm. There's much that we can absorb here, but for the remainder of our time today, we're simply going to focus on verse 4, the beauty of the Lord. The beauty of the Lord. Of seeking God's face in the framework of His beauty. One thing I have desired of the Lord, David writes, one thing, one thing I have desired. That will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And why? To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Two things. Beholding the beauty of the Lord and inquiring in His temple. We will see that this involves an affective, emotional component, and a mental, intellectual component. What do you never weary of beholding that is beautiful? Now, I know you have one. I imagine that some of your most treasured, visual, beautiful experiences are similar to mine. I love the beauty of the beach. Most everybody does love the beauty of the beach. A sunset at the beach is just awe-inspiring. I love the beauty of the mountains. Recently, during our Carolina camp meeting that took place at the end of May and the beginning of June, I was up on the Blue Ridge Parkway doing something that I like to do called riding a bicycle. I had my AirPods in. I was listening to Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I was listening to Michael W. Smith. I was listening to some other artists. And it was just an experience of worship on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I took that picture. Beautiful mountain ridges floating across the horizon. I love the mountains. Many of you know that. I didn't take this picture, but I think this is of... Shining Rock Black Balsam area, again, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I like mountains in western North Carolina. I like mountains in California. I like mountains in Italy. And we had the awesome privilege to be in the Dolomites just a few weeks ago. Amazing mountain vistas. The beach and the mountains. Okay, we're not going to play this game too long. But if you had to choose one... Would you live at the beach or would you live at the mountains? Tell me afterward. <laughs> Nature is just filled with beauty. You don't want to get too close to the tiger, but what design there? The design of a butterfly. We, we think of the design of the human body. It's a beautiful work of art. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The intricacy of flowers and all the subtle colors. The turning of the trees in autumn. It is amazingly beautiful. A baby is beautiful, especially when it's yours. Now some others may go, yep, that's a baby. But for you, your child, your grandchild... It is the most beautiful baby in the world. It's beautiful to see young love. And it's beautiful to see matured love. 50 year plus love in a committed marriage relationship. Service is a beautiful experience to participate in. A selflessly giving of one's time and energy, and heart. What do you never weary of beholding that is beautiful? Well, David says, I want to hold, behold the beauty of the Lord. And the word itself means that 
the one who is observing this beauty is moved by its loveliness. It yields a sense of pleasure to the one who is viewing. Beholding the beauty of the Lord is being moved by the loveliness of the Lord, experiencing pleasure and satisfaction, not obligation, but I get to. Big difference between those. Beholding the beauty of the Lord, moved by the loveliness of the Lord, experiencing pleasure, satisfaction. That is the emotional, the affective. But David also talks about inquiring in his temple. In other words, engaging in a detailed examination of evidence to determine the truth of a matter. That which is intellectually drawing, intriguing. Now we're going to be looking at various aspects of the temple in coming weeks. But just by way of generalities, what shows the beauty of the Lord in his house, in his temple? What shows the beauty of the Lord in his temple? From a bird's eye view, just from a generalized view, we cannot think about the temple without thinking about the context in which the temple, the sanctuary, was given to us, rather. The sanctuary, the wilderness sanctuary. The entire book of Exodus is the context of God's temple, his sanctuary. If you were to outline the entire 40 chapters of Exodus into three parts. It would be bush, hill, and then tent, house. The first 18 chapters have all to do with the calling of Moses and Moses' leadership, God empowering him, and bringing the children of Israel out of slavery from Egypt. The hill, as they gather at Mount Sinai, receiving the ten words, and then the design of the temple to come. So bush, hill, and tent. God brought his people out of slavery. It was an act of deliverance. The parting of the Red Sea. The provision of water in the wilderness. All of this was significant to the setup of beholding the beauty in his beauty of the Lord in his temple. In Exodus 19, we read this. As God proclaims to his community, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So God reveals himself in his sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, he begins to teach them about the provision of forgiveness and how reconciliation is to take place. In the whole sacrificial system, we see the combination of justice and mercy. We're going to be looking at this in greater detail in weeks to come. In reflecting upon the character of God, another psalm, David offers these observations. Psalm 103 and verse 10 he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. This is just an introduction into beholding the beauty of the Lord. Being moved by the loveliness of the Lord. Experiencing pleasure and satisfaction as we intellectually begin to explore the significance of his character in his temple. So dwelling in the house of the Lord is an experience of beauty. Set in the setting of Psalm 27, which is a combination of strength, and vulnerability. David writes, Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and as such breathe out violence. Now, we don't know the exact timing, the chronology of when David penned Psalm 27. We've looked at, in retrospect, 
his encounter with Goliath and how that was such a championing experience for David. But David wasn't 100% on top of his game. There were seasons in which he struggled greatly. And we can identify with that as well. And as the Lord was patient and merciful with him, the Lord is patient and merciful with us as well. One of these is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 21, in which through the stress of being continually hunted by Saul, David experiences a low emotional period of time, and he says, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to go over to one of the communities of the Philistines, and there I'm going to feign like I've gone insane. And he does so, and he lets the saliva dribble out of the corner of his mouth and down onto his beard. David has been anointed as the king. He's the king elect. And here he says, I'm weary of this. I don't want any more of this. I just want to escape. Have you ever been there with some monumental challenge that you are right in the middle of? In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the author comments on this particular chapter in David's experience. We read this, when shadows encompass the soul, we want light and guidance. We must look up. There is light beyond the darkness. David ought not to have distrusted God for one moment. He had cause for trusting in him. He was the Lord's anointed, and in the midst of danger, he had been protected by the angels of God. He had been armed with courage to do wonderful things. And if he had but removed his mind from the distressing situation in which he was placed and had thought of God's power and his majesty, he would have been at peace even in the midst of the shadows of death. You've been there? I've been there, and I've also experienced what it is to consciously, intentionally remove my mind from that which is distressing. It doesn't neutralize the reality of what's happening, but to simply remove the mind and focus upon God's majesty and his power. And somehow, mysteriously, spiritually, I am renewed to go back and deal with the reality that is distressing. Another application of this, from my perspective, is just the general social media information saturated context in which we live. Just Bam, 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 bam. Headline after headline. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Sometimes you just need to take a break. Pull the, shut, shut it down. Pull the cord, whatever, however we want to describe it. Just disconnect and renew in the spiritual presence of God. Psalm 63 tells us this, O God, you are my God, early will I seek you, Your soul thirsts for, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. To you. Your loving kindness is better than life. This is the beauty of the Lord that moves one to pleasure, spiritual pleasure. Now the whole sanctuary theme is not just locked in to Exodus or Psalms. It is something that continues on throughout the entire scriptures. In John chapter 1, we read this concerning Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
That is not a random word to describe Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It harkens back to the statement that God gave in Exodus 25, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. John 1, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Just as God dwelt with his children in the wilderness, now he comes in the flesh to dwell with his children through the person of Jesus. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary because your loving kindness is better than life. What did people see in the sanctuary of Jesus as a human being? Two examples. The fisherman turned disciple to become apostle Peter saw in Jesus amazing life transforming beauty. To have been reinstated into ministry following his denial at Jesus' most vulnerable moment was something that transformed Peter until he likewise was crucified, according to tradition, upside down. Because he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified upright like my Savior was. I will be crucified upside down. In Jesus, who dwelt among us, Peter beheld the beauty of the Lord. Another example is Mary. Oh, how we could explore that and have explored that. Mary, from whom seven demons were cast forth. Mary, who did unreasonable things in appreciation, love, and worship for Jesus. Spending exorbitant amounts of money, showering her affection upon him, her life was transformed by the beauty of the Lord personified in Jesus. Now, I didn't write this little literary piece here that we're going to read, but it is illustrative of what happens to an individual who has witnessed the beauty of the Lord and is transformed by it. It's titled, Pretty Ugly. I'm very ugly, so don't try to convince me that I'm a very beautiful person, because at the end of the day, I hate myself in every single way, and I'm not going to lie to myself by saying there is beauty inside of me that matters. So rest assured, I will remind myself that I am a worthless, terrible person. And nothing you say will make me believe I still need love. Because no matter what, I am not good enough to be loved. And I am not in a position to believe that beauty does exist within me. Because whenever I look into the mirror... I always think, am I as ugly as people say? <clears throat> Millions of people live with this mindset. Millions. What happens when one encounters the beauty of the Lord? Coming into an experience of knowing that His loving kindness is better than life. It flips the process, the sequence of what we think about ourselves. The same words now read from the bottom up. Am I as ugly as people say? I always think because whenever I look in the mirror, beauty does exist within me. And I'm not in a position to believe that I'm not good enough to be loved because no matter what, I still need love. And nothing you say will make me believe that I am a worthless person. So rest assured, I will remind myself 
there is beauty inside me that matters. And I'm not going to lie to myself by saying I hate myself in every way because at the end of the day, I am a very beautiful person. So don't try to convince me that I'm very ugly. The before and the after of encountering the beauty of the Lord. I've shared this observation from the book Education a few times before, but I come back to it again because it's made such an impact upon my experience. In every human being, Jesus discerned infinite possibilities. He saw men as they might be, transfigured by his grace. In what? In the beauty of the Lord, according to Psalm 90. Looking upon them with hope, he inspired hope. Meeting them with confidence, he inspired trust. Revealing in himself man's true ideal, he awakened for its attainment both desire and faith. In his presence, souls despised and fallen realized that they still were men and they longed to prove themselves worthy of his regard. In many a heart that seemed dead to all things holy were awakened new impulses. To many a despairing one, there opened the possibility of a new life. Encountering the beauty of the Lord. In weeks to come, we'll explore this in greater detail. But the structure of the sanctuary can actually become a pathway of prayer for us. In which within our imagination, we go into the design of the sanctuary and pray through what we see there. From the altar of burnt offering out in the courtyard, representing the cross of Christ, into the holy place where we see the table of showbread and we think of Jesus' words, I am the bread of life, all the way into the most holy place which contained the Ten Commandments and the mercy seat, God's justice and mercy perfectly balanced together. We'll talk about this more in weeks to come. Oh, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. So we've gone now from Exodus to Jesus in John 1 and now to the close of the Scriptures in Revelation and we see this thread of the temple and the beauty of the Lord being woven throughout. In Revelation 22, we read this, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit in every month. And there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and His servants shall serve Him and they shall see His face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Beholding <laughs> the beauty of the Lord. I'm looking forward to our times together as we continue to investigate, as we continue to dwell upon and drink in the beauty of the Lord. As we think of those words from Revelation, we think of the words of a song face to face, if my brothers will join me here, anticipating what it may be for us to literally, physically, be in the facial presence of God and the joy and the heart satisfaction that that brings 
and how that can give us strength from day to day in our present meantime. 